Rabbi, who sinned? That's the question posed on a bulletin insert to be used in religious services during the month of May, which is Mental Health Month. It raises the issue of whether mental illness has a spiritual root. Hello, I'm Richard Thompson, pastor of Central Presbyterian Church, and your host for today's edition of Austin Faith Dialogue. Austin has been a center for the mental health movement simply because of its location as the city's capital. With the Mental Health and Mental Redactation Agency headquartered in this city, we're in a unique setting for the public programs in Texas. But within the religious community, services are also being offered to meet a variety of individual and group needs. That support brings us back to the question with which we began. How are we to relate spiritual to mental health? Is emotional distress in any way connected with a person's relationship to God? And what are the differences between the types of mental illness and the kinds of therapy available to cope with these difficulties? To help us probe this matter as it comes to bear in our locality, we're privileged to have as our guests, Jean Avera, counselor at the Samaritan Pastoral Counseling Center, and Kent Miller, coordinator of resource development for the Benedictine Health Resource Center. We welcome you both. Thank you. And um, I'd like to, first of all, Kent, have you tell us just a little bit about uh, what the, your service offers. Well, the Benedictine Health Resource Center is an agency that's designed to help the religious community deal with all kinds of health issues, to develop access to health care in the state of Texas, for instance, to help churches and religious groups uh, develop ministries in health and health care, and uh, we even try to educate the public around health care ethics. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what an overview of what so we So it's do. a rather broadly based uh, mandate that you have. That's right. And the fact that it's uh, Benedictine means, uh, are you sponsored by the Catholic Church? We're sponsored by the Benedictine uh, Order of Nuns in Bernie, Texas. I see. But ecumenical in our staffing and in our, uh, who we reach out to. And. Um, uh, Gene, I think that when I announced uh, the agency that you're with, I said the Samaritan Pastoral Counseling Center is just Samaritan Counseling Center. That's right. Mm -hmm. But it's located in a church and has some connection in that regard. That's right. We're a pastoral care counseling center, and we're located in uh, three churches here in Austin, one at Central Presbyterian Church, uh, Shepherd of the Hills, which is in Oak Hill, and then in Round Rock, in the Round Rock Presbyterian Church. And um, is this... Uh, a, a service that is related to the religious community in any explicit way other than being in the, the facility of these churches? Well, in the sense that um, all of the counselors who are on our staff are related in some way to, uh, to a church. Our director is a uh, ordained minister. Um, we are um, our ministry is to people under stress uh, who come from any kind of uh, any path of life, so to speak, and it's certainly it's not it's a non-denominational. Mm -hmm. Not limited uh, to uh, people who profess a particular faith. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I'd like to uh, fairly early on in our conversation pick up on what I think uh, is important for the, the, the balance of our thoughts in, in regard to the relation between what you call the stress problems, stress-related issues, mm -hmm. and mental illness. How would you distinguish between those uh, in, in, as you have worked through your agency, Ken? Well, I think there's basically two ways you can approach it. The relationship between religious faith and mental illness and mental health. and uh, I think when we talk about mental illness, the problem is that there's so many ways in which diseases that come under that over that general overview of mental illness. But there's uh, some very basic differences in that some diseases have a very physical basis. Some mental diseases are physically based. Schizophrenia is one of those. And what we have come to call uh, manic depressive behavior or bipolar disorder is another one. Uh, one that we haven't understood for a long time, autism, is another one of those that have physical basis that you can see in the brain under certain, you know,
conditions. All right, so in other words, they have done research to show that there's a chemistry involved with that kind of, uh, of illness. That's right. And that um, this question that was posed at the beginning that uh, asks who sinned in regard to illness uh, is inappropriate from the standpoint of this research. From the standpoint of what we now know about the brain and the way it functions and mental illness, there's a whole category of those illnesses that for whom which that question is not relevant because it's a it's an issue of uh, something physically happening to that person at a specific time in their life that causes uh, brain dysfunction or and uh, chemical problems mm -hmm. all right well let's uh, let's take a, a typical day in the life of your practice Gene. I mean someone is coming to you with what you have identified as being stress related difficulties mm -hmm. Uh, does that mean that you don't deal with people who would have mental illness as a chemical condition? Well, I have kind of a uh, case that I thought I might uh, tell you about. It uh, happened several years ago and uh, uh, very interesting in the aspect that I think it does tie together uh, the physiological base of, uh, in this sense, depression and then uh, the kind of help that uh, people may find from uh, just talking to a pastoral counselor. Uh, the uh, case is one of a young man who came who was very depressed at the time and uh, uh, almost bordering on a phobia. He had a lot of fears and he was uh, very uh, resistant or hesitant to come to a well come for counseling and I think a lot of the uh, stigma that's attached to certainly mental illness and uh, that uh, you know uh, we're not quite right when if we need to seek help for our uh, for our problems so he um, didn't come very often or very regularly and and really didn't do much about his depression i feeling the same way that kent does or knowing that depression is a physiological base had referred him to a psychiatrist mm -hmm. he was very resistant to do that so he did not comply with with that with that suggestion so uh, as time went on, uh, he would come ever so often and really was not, not doing much better. And uh, so as things got uh, progressively worse, he uh, actually another doctor referred him to a psychiatrist, at which point he did go to a psychiatrist and was uh, beginning to be to take some antidepressants, which were, uh, he was having some side effects and some symptoms and he was going to have to change and so forth. So he finally came and he said, look, I'm ready to work on, on this problem I have and I want to make a commitment here, but I, I need to be sure this is all confidential and so forth. Well, I reassured him, reassured him it was. Then he proceeded to tell me a very dark secret that he had kept for many years that he had not told anyone and that uh, has had borne heavily on his soul. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, uh, I, I listened and we worked some more and he, uh, he came some more times and in about a month he uh, came in and was feeling much better, uh, almost amazingly better. There was no signs of uh, the depression that had been there. So, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, we look at uh, depression and the causes of it and uh, the what, what is in our soul as far as spiritual concerns are, and, and it seemed that in this case, um, his uh, being ashamed, uh, feeling guilty, uh, feeling like this behavior uh, was not acceptable, uh, had depressed him to the extent that he uh, was showing classic signs of, of a physiological depression. But as it turned out, he really did not need to take the antidepressants. And so... Oh, I see. Um, so in other words, the, uh, the experience with that particular individual said to you that there was uh, really a, a relationship, an emotional um, and with a spiritual dimension in terms of confession was the issue. It, it really seemed to be in that case, uh-huh. Yeah. And that, uh, that that would be distinguished in a sense from what you would call, Kent, uh, mental illness. Serious mental illness that has that physiological basis, and this is, I don't know if this person did or didn't, and you know, that medication may have been helping too we don't mm -hmm. know but mm -hmm. that's right there is a big difference uh, and one of the big differences is that when you have that physiological basis for it then one of the spiritual dimensions of that is that for all the years that we have laid the guilt back on the parents or the family members or something for being part of the cause of mental illness mm -hmm. that guilt can now be lifted okay 
and the freedom that can be you can experience once you get out from under treating mental illness as caused by some parent or siblings uh, response to the person is a tremendously liberating thing. So it's uh, it's liberating uh, both from the standpoint of the individual that's involved and family members, others who may have said, well, what could I have done differently? That's right. Uh -huh. What did I do to cause it? Uh -huh. Well, you probably did nothing in, in many of the cases. Uh, you know, the physical basis is there and you didn't, you know, it wasn't the way you talked to him when he grew up, uh -huh. which is one of the ways we've talked about schizophrenia. Well, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that um, you're, you come to this position uh, with the Benedictine Resource Center as a, as a clergy person, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you're doing now administrative work and interpretive work and something that's other than with individuals one-on-one. -on -one. That's right. Uh, but uh, you had experience as a pastor in, in a previous uh, existence. That's right. <laughs> Well, one of the things that got me into this was that I, I was doing um, a ministry in San Antonio and we had the opportunity to work, on, uh, work with a program called the Fairweather Lodge, where as a clergy person and working with a group of churches, we, we help bring people out of the state hospital and set them up to live in the community mm -hmm. as individual citizens, out from under the burden of being mental health, uh, mentalist, mental health, uh, patients and uh, we worked in a program that attempted to take away the stigma of having a mental illness and tried to normalize their relationships by having them participate in the congregation to having them accepted as you know ordinary people but who have an illness and that's where I came to begin to understand and to work with um, how the church and uh, needs to open its doors to the persons who have mental illness okay so was that uh that experience in relation to the community and right. to how the churches as, uh, as a supportive community could make a difference in terms of a person's recovery. That's right. Tremendous difference. And um, do you find, uh, Gene, in working with individuals that you have uh, occasion to refer them to a community of faith or to some kind of a, a supportive uh, network that is um, beyond just, you know, your individual relationship to them? I think oftentimes people who uh, come in for counseling um, are feeling uh, estranged, uh, cut off, uh, alone. Uh, their problems are such that they have uh, felt like that they have no, no way, no further resources to, to deal with them. And uh, I think in, in working with individuals, uh, and, and basically I, our approach is to help them tap those resources within themselves that they're not aware of, that they can begin to cope better with their situations, that we certainly suggest that there are other resources in the community and all kinds of support groups. Uh, churches offer uh, a lot of support uh, as far as uh, just making connections with people. So I think in that way, the, the faith network uh, in the community can be very helpful to people who are feeling just uh, alone and desperate and that no one, else, no one else has the same kind of problems they do. And so I think that that's a real uh, helpful way to, we, we all can be of help to each other. So in a sense, what you're doing is you're encouraging them to find those networks. Mm -hmm. you, you don't necessarily have a list of, of these resources that you refer them to, but to help them make their own discoveries. Well, we have, you know, we certainly do have resources as, as far as uh, a lot of times people who come in to, um, for counseling may have uh, been involved in a family where there was alcoholism, may have been involved in a family where there was uh, uh, various kinds of addictions. Uh, there are an, a numerous uh, support groups here in our community for people who want to be involved in the Adult Children of Alcoholics program, uh, the, the AA program, the Al-Anon program various kinds of supports. There's uh, some of the other, uh, we offer ongoing seminars uh, for people who want to know more about the dynamics of marriage, the dynamics of family systems. Uh, mm -hmm. So we try to connect people with what's available here in the community, which, which is a lot. We have a lot of, of resources here. I think we're lucky in Austin from that standpoint. And uh, the fact that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is the center of, of, of the state network of agencies and around that with as many uh, uh, private services that are offered 
and I'd like to uh, lift up in just a few moments uh, some of these others that are in, in the Austin area that you might share with us. Mm -hmm. um, but Ken, I'd like to come back to your experience in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. and as you came here, uh, you are now applying yourself to networking in this broader way. But I, I noticed in this uh, material that included this bulletin insert, yes. Rabbi Hussein. Something that you said that, uh, as a pastor myself, I, I was struck by. And uh, I'd like to probe this with you because I think uh, as our viewers may be part of religious communities, uh, they can ask themselves the same question. In a church service, or a religious service, where there are remembrances of people in need, and uh, a particular parishioner may be in a hospital for a heart attack, or somebody is in for uh, uh, a broken back, or some physical condition. We remember them in our prayers, but that there seems to be a kind of taboo that's involved in remembering people who may be in an institution where they are recovering from a mental illness, and that there is a silence in regard to that that you highlight in this material. And I must confess that before reading that material, uh, I hadn't thought about it in that sharp a way. And I wonder if you're finding others that this is a, a new perspective for them. Not only is it new, but it's frightening because there is an unwritten rule that the minister shall not mem mention the family member who has mental illness and the family member won't expect that the minister shall pray for them in public. Mm -hmm because there is this stigma, this point of view, that um, basically for, for decades has placed blame within the family structure. And it's a matter of shame. And uh, it's a matter of shame and mm -hmm, guilt. Mm -hmm. And you know, you don't talk about Uncle John, and you don't talk about the son who was reared in the church and went off to college, but then became diagnosed with schizophrenia, and now nobody talks about him, although everybody talks about all the other college kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's an, a sort of an unwritten rule about how you don't mention this anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's where this community of faith um, has an opportunity now, I think, to open up because we now have different understandings of what mental illness is. I'd like to problem solve something with you here because to, to move off of this traditional track and expectation and practice toward one that is more open and and being able to talk about a variety of conditions. Mm -hmm. of, um, do you offer counseling to churches, clergy, about ways of, of making this acceptable, whereas before it's not been considered, you know, uh, appropriate? Uh, do you, for instance, have them talk to the family and say, I would like to be able to include in prayers of petition and intercession the individual in your family mm -hmm. uh, by the, name and uh, is that the kind of I think of there's a range of, yeah that's right and I think there's a range of things that the pastor the clergy person and the church can do or the religious community can do to help make the it, it acceptable for families who have mental illness just as it is acceptable for families who have cancer or mm -hmm. heart problems mm -hmm. and Part of it is educating the rest of the community about what the reality is, not just the inner re relationship with the pastor and the family, but with the rest of the community. There needs to be an education process. And I think in all reality, there has to be an education about what happens when John or Sarah walks into a group or to, or to worship. And it may be that their behavior is a bit different. I mean, you can look at them and see something's going on. Well, there needs to be an acceptance that that's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that's okay. When somebody wheels in in a wheelchair, that's different. But that's okay. We can accept that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, but there, that education needs to take place. So it's a way of how can we open the understanding to open the doors for an honest, supportive, loving relationship with that family. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, that would have... Uh, an implication in terms of the kinds of worship services that we have and the whole feeling tone of a congregation and uh, a, a, a process of re-education of people about what is appropriate behavior in church and among other things the implication is that appropriate behavior is to be natural, to be, uh, to be accepting of differences 
and to be learning about those differences. Excuse me. You yeah. had some or, or the coffee hour, or a church school class, or a discussion group. Mm -hmm. You know, every aspect of the church life, the religious community life, to open that up to say, we can accept that person. We can interrelate with that person. Mm -hmm. And not that we accept everything that that person might do, or that we accept the depression or the view of reality that they have. But there are ways in which we can learn to help that person and ourselves deal with that honest behavior as a part of the illness. I think that um, as you work with people in your service, uh, Gene, that uh, the extent to which you work with churches, you're not only working with individuals and helping them find a place in given congregations or communities of faith, but uh, you actually offer training for people in congregations to make them to do, to do some of this consciousness raising that uh, Kent's talking about? We have in the past done um, several seminars on lay pastoral care, and I guess that's kind of an ongoing how to care for other people. Um, I think what Ken's talking about is it would be a wonderful educational program, desensitizing people to um, mental illness and that we, we're all the same and uh, uh, helping opening people's eyes and raising their awareness and making them more conscious of uh, the kinds of, I think, the, really the kinds of uh, stigma that people who are severely mentally ill uh, operate under. So this is certainly something that we're interested in, and we do do a lot of educational work in churches and, and various workshops, and uh, it's something that I, I think is, is uh, its time has come. Mm -hmm. And um, you're, uh, you're mentioning the, the services through these particular three churches uh, in Austin. Uh, mm -hmm. What other pastoral care-related services okay. are there? I, I did bring a list. There are other pastoral care counseling centers here in Austin, and um, there's the New Life Institute. Uh, there's the Lighthouse. Shoal Creek has a Christian counseling service. There's the Pastoral Counseling and Education Center, and then there's the uh, Counseling and Pastoral Care Center of Austin. So there are, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for people to avail themselves of pastoral counseling here in mm -hmm. Austin. Well, when you say pastoral counseling, I think it's important to say that this is not just something that pastors are doing. I mean, you're not a pastor. No, uh -uh. Um, all of the people who are work in pastoral care counseling centers are trained professionals who have uh, degree, varying degrees. They may have uh, be social workers like myself. They may be clinical psychologists. Uh, there are psychiatrists who work in pastoral counseling centers. There are uh, trained pastoral counselors who've been through a training program. And I think the thing that, that we all have in common are we're trained professionals who have a sense of spirituality and are interested in looking at the, the, the whole person. So that's what makes it pastoral, is, is that there's a spiritual dimension in, in regard to the caring, the motivation that's causing you to do this work, to be open to uh, people's need for um, a, a spiritual understanding as well as, as a psychological understanding. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to, uh, Kent, just come back to another thing mentioned earlier as far as um, the mental health movement mm -hmm. more broadly. It's, it was uh, the mental health month, uh, mm -hmm. May. That's not just a church-related uh, no. activity. By no means. I mean, the Benedictines didn't start that. No. Uh, no. But you're cooperating with others in that. We have a, uh, I'm working in a particular program um, that's called Pathways to Hope. And it's a, it's a one-time effort put together by a group of religious clergy folks to try in May to bring together clergy persons from across the state. We're sending out 20,000 invitations. You know there are that many clergy people in the state of Texas? <laughs> 20,000 invitations to come to a two-day workshop that will help begin to develop some skills Mm -hmm. with clergy in working with people and families who have, are affected by mental illness. A study was done recently that said of people who get mental illness, 40% first turn to their clergy, 10% receive help, largely because clergy people don't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. Maybe intimidated by them. And very intimidated. Uh, and one of the skill workshops, for instance, is when somebody comes to your office and they are acting bizarre, as a pastor, you don't know if they're high on drugs and coming in wanting food. You don't know if they're mentally ill. You know, those are too big. You don't know if they're drunk. 
you know you don't know what the problem is right and so intervention skills to begin to quickly determine and to deescalate and to act as a you know person who has some control and knowledge is that's a very important skill and this is going to be held uh, where this when? will be held may twenty third and twenty fourth in uh, houston mm -hmm. and to it's available to clergy all across the state and um the extent to which uh, we have uh, numbers that people can call for information about that, why don't you give us that very quickly? They could call the Benedictine Health Resource Center here in Austin, and the number is 339-9724. And I'd be happy to get an invitation, a brochure to them. All right. And uh, what's the Samaritan Center's number? Just uh... The Samaritan County Center is 472-2453. OK. Well, thank you for that. And as we bring this discussion to a close today, I want to thank our guests, uh, Jean Avery and Kent Miller, for their participation in helping probe these issues of mental and spiritual health. We trust that you will have found these views helpful and that this program will have forwarded a better understanding of what make individuals and the community whole. We thank you for watching and invite you to be with us next week for Austin Faith Dialogue. Good day.